So the title of today's talk is Maximal Resolution from the Ronke Graham, Human versus Deep Learning. And what I'm going to show is how we can achieve superior assessment of scanning transmission electron microscope uh, convergence angle determination to give superior resolution and imaging conditions using deep learning and using Ronchigrams and new heuristics for assessing Ronchigrams. So on the right hand side is an image of the so-called Ronchigram and in it is the aperture selection chosen by a microscopist as well as a deep learning network shown in pink. So when we look at the microscopist selection of an aperture here highlighted in green, we see the probe formed on the right has a full width half max of 1.3 angstroms corresponding to a 17 milliradian choice. The network's choice, however, at 11 milliradians gives a smaller full width half max of 1.1 angstrom. But perhaps more important than the resolution is the improvement in overall probe quality. The network selection has a more rotationally symmetric probe, and the microscopist selection has a broken symmetry and nasty probe tails that can degrade the interpretation of your images. So what we'll show is the heuristics uh, of how we determine the training for the network selection and how that outperforms the electron microscopist. This work was done, I'm having trouble changing slides. This work was done by two students in my group, Sukhyun Sung, who's here as a co-presenter to answer questions after the talk, as well as Noah Schnitzer. Um, and it's based on the work that they published in 2019 and 2020, uh, articles on optimal stem convergence angle selection using neural networks and stroll ratio, as well as an introduction to the Ronchigram and how we simulate it. So I know there are many electron microscopists in the talk, but for those that aren't, let me just cover the, bit, the, the basics. In a scanning transmission electron microscope, we have a 30 to 300 keV electron beam that's focused onto the entrance surface of a sample. So this stack of multipole lenses, in the case of aberration correction, can achieve a full width half max of the wave function intensity of an angstrom or less that's focused onto the entrance surface of the sample and scanned in a raster fashion. The elastically scattered electrons that are scattered out to high angles can be collected in an annular dark field detector. This is a Rutherford scattering process, so it's proportional to the number of protons that's scattered off of each atom. The forward inelastically scattered electrons can be collected in an electron energy loss spectrometer and sorted by their energy. Let's just consider the image formed from an annular dark field detector. Here is an ADF stem image of tantalum sulfur selenide, and the fuzzy white atoms you see are the, the heavier tantalum atoms, and the lighter atoms in between are sulfur and selenium atoms. What we're looking at is not the structure of the atoms, that is, we're not looking at the atomic orbitals of the atom, but instead we're looking at a convolution of the shape of the electron probe with the atomic nuclei. So these images are formed under an incoherent linear imaging model where the shape of the probe, here shown as an airy disk, is scanned across the sample and scatters off the atomic nuclei to form an image that is effectively the probe shape at every atomic coordinate. And again, this is a simple linear Im imaging model, but what it highlights is that the images we see are ultimately dictated by the quality, shape, and size of the probe. So getting this right is critical, and it's critical especially in aberration corrected electron microscopes where we're trying to push to higher convergence angles. So aberrations can be seen in a ray diagram as an incorrect focusing of the rays onto the focal plane. So for example, spherical aberration would cause the aberration, the, the rays at higher convergence angles to be converged over focused. We can also imagine this as a a wave front, the lens bending the wave fronts of our electron wave function down to a point on the sample. If it was a perfect lens, these would be spherical wave fronts that would converge down to a single point. However, with aberrations, the aberrations are the deviations in those wave fronts from that perfect spherical lens. And so we can approximate them as phase shifts in the wave front. And those phase shifts can be represented in an aberration function that's a polynomial expansion with a series of aberration coefficients. So the coefficients on each polynomial is indexed with an integer n or m. Here, alpha is our convergence angle to the power n. 
And we also have a symmetry term, M, that dictates the azimuthal symmetry of each term in the polynomial expansion. So here is what a phase might look like across an aperture in an electron microscope. What we see is there's a large phase variation between 0 and 2 pi, and that variation happens more rapidly at the higher convergence angles out towards the edge of the disk. If we look at the probe formed from this phase variation in the 64 milliradian aperture, the probe looks quite messy, as does the phase, uh, the change in the phase across the aperture. However, the center of the aperture shows a much more uniform uh, region of the phase. And so if we put a smaller aperture that only considers this more uniform region, we get a much cleaner probe. We not only get higher resolution, but we also get uh, a more symmetric probe. So the choice of the aperture and the, the size of the aperture is critical to the imaging conditions. So unfortunately, we don't get to see the phase, the phase across the aperture caused by these electromagnetic lenses. Instead, we have to rely on the Ronchi-gram. The Ronchi-gram is a name, perhaps hard to say, but it honors the Italian physicist Vasco Ronchi, who in 1923 developed a standard test for shaping aberration-free light optical lenses. In this eponymous Ronchi test, an optical lens is focusing light onto a Ronchi grating comprised of alternating dark and clear stripes with spacing comparable to the wavelengths of light. Without this grating, a convergent beam diffraction pattern appears as a uniform bright disk. However, if we have this Ronchi grating in place, imperfections in the lens are revealed in these interference patterns here shown as vertical stripes. So we can assess the quality of lens based on the shape and structure of these interference patterns. Unfortunately, constructing a Ronchi, Ronchi's linear grating isn't possible in an electron microscope, so instead we use atomic arrangements of amorphous materials with very close bond lengths that are comparable to the diffracting wavelength of the electron microscope. So an electron microscope at 200 keV would have a wavelength of 2.5 picometers. So the amorphous grating of atoms mimics the Ronchi test by providing interference patterns that reveal aberrations in these electromagnetic lenses. In 1979, Cowley began investigating the electron Ronchi gram, coined the term electron Ronchi gram, and demonstrated its utility for measuring and correcting aberrations in scanning transmission electron microscopy. So, in the soupy grist, grist of these uh, Ronchi grams exist patterns that trained electron microscopists can use to immediately assess the quality of an instrument's alignment. The presence of low order aberrations, like this twofold astigmatism, can be seen as a, a stretching of the region of high magnification. Axial coma shifts the center of the Ronchi gram. Threefold astigmatism adds a threefold symmetric lobes to the Ronchi gram. And we can use these features to tune, shape, sculpt the Ronchi gram to get a region of high magnification and high uniformity. That's shown in the top left here. For a well aligned Ronchi gram, we have a region with minimal variation. And this is the usable part of the beam that we'll, we'll use for high resolution imaging. So unfortunately, if you're not familiar with the shape of these Ronchi grams and, and what, they, what they mean in terms of aberrations, um, it can be tricky. So it takes years of experience to, to intuit the best Ronchi gram for imaging. And as I'll show, even expert electron microscopists can get it wrong. So if you want to build experience in looking at the structure of Ronchi grams, we've built a website, ronchigram.com, which runs simulations. So if an emergency arises, you're at the airport, you're at dinner, you need a Ronchi gram really quick, it runs in your web browser, runs on your phone. And if you visit ronchigram.com, this is what the website looks like. It presents you on the left a image of the Ronchi gram. And it will show, so the left is the image of the Ronchi gram. It will show an aperture selection shown in blue based on a pi over four phase limit rule. So the pi over four phase limit map on the right is showing the aberrations in white that have not yet exceeded a total phase shift of pi over four. And then blue is the maximal aperture that fits within it. It looks like the animation's not playing. But down below, if you scroll down to the website, you can tune, you could specify any aberration you want on the Ronchi gram, and you can see how those aberrations affect the structure and shape of the Ronchi grams.
Um, I often just use the website to quickly get an estimate of the diffracted limited resolution or the wavelength of an electron. So it's a useful website for beginners, but I think even advanced electron microscopists will find it useful. So how do we simulate the Ronchi grams? We can do it quite quickly and efficiently just using a couple Fourier transforms. So the Ronchi gram is uh, a a beam that diffracts through an objective aperture. This is this A of K term. That is the, basically a disk. And it picks up phases based on the aberrations in the lens. This is this complex exponential with this chi term. This chi is our aberration function. Ideally, we'd have no aberrations. We'd have a uniform phase. But in reality, we have a series of aberrations uh, that can be represented as that polynomial expansion shown earlier. We then Fourier transform to diffract onto the sample. The sample then adds an additional phase term to the probe, which is dictated by the structure of our material, that's this V of R, and an impact parameter related to the wavelength of the electron. We then transmit onto another diffraction plane, this is where our camera is, through another Fourier transform. What we measure in quantum mechanics, again, is the amplitude squared of the wave function, so we lose the phase information. And this is our Ronchi gram. So we can run simulations for any aberration function. And we can do it efficiently with just a couple Fourier transforms. Here I'm showing Ronchi grams as we're adding higher and higher order aberrations. And what you'll notice as more aberrations come into the simulation, the region of phase variation on the outskirts increases and the region of high magnification in the center, the uniform uh, uh, phase gets smaller. So the game is to choose an aperture that best selects the maximal uniform region uh, of, of this phase. However, there's a fundamental trade-off that's happening. As we make a smaller and smaller aperture, we reduce the diffraction limited resolution of our microscope. So the total, the higher frequencies that we can achieve by the outer aperture angle determines our diffraction limit. This probe size will decrease as that aperture gets smaller. And in this case, probe size, decreasing probe size is good, right? Higher resolution. But there's a trade-off where eventually aberrations come in and they degrade the probe size, making the probe size larger. So the blue curve here is the diffraction limited resolution and the red curve here is the probe size due to spherical aberration alone. And there'll be an optimum convergent semi-angle somewhere in between. In the case of spherical aberrations, you can analytically determine what this optimal semi-convergence angle is. Here it's shown as alpha, and it's directly related, inversely related to the spherical aberration. So if you have higher spherical aberrations, then you'll need a smaller convergence angle. Unfortunately, spherical aberrations are just one of many aberrations that exist in the electron microscope. However, the trend is nonetheless the same, even if it can't be determined analytically. Kirkland has shown uh, in, his, in his paper some examples of this, where we see the probe size again get smaller and smaller as we increase our aperture size up to a point where higher order aberrations overtake and degrade the, the resolution of the microscope. For typical microscopes, the optimal objective aperture size will be between 20 and 30 milliradians. So how we determine this optimal convergence angle is based on heuristics, most famously the, the pi over four phase rule. So here I'm showing in the top left the total phase shift due to two aberrations, a spherical C3 aberration and a spherical C1 aberration. C1 is just your defocus, and we'll use the defocus to uh, offset the C3 aperture. And this is typical that, that lower order aberrations are used to offset the higher order aberrations, such that the total phase function, this chi, is as flat and uniform as possible. And so we want to keep chi uh, within a band that's pi over 4, or at least this is the traditional heuristic. And we can have a more strict heuristic that says any single aberration should be less than pi over 4, but more often it's the total aberrations. And this works well for spherical aberrations. However, this pi over four phase rule does, performs poorly when you include non-rotationally um, symmetric aberrations. For more complex aberrations, what we recommend is the Strel ratio. So the Strel ratio is the ratio of an 
unaberrated probe, that's shown here in red, to that of the aberrated probe. So we look at the peak intensity of an unaberrated probe and we compare that to the peak intensity of the aberrated probe. What typically happens when you introduce aberrations is you take away intensity from the forward direction, that is the peak intensity, and you throw it into the probe tails. And if we consider an 80%, uh, a Strel ratio of 0 0.8, that'd be a 20% reduction in the intensity, and that corresponds to the pi over 4 rule that's most often used. However, the Strel ratio works well for any aberration. So what I want to convince you of is that the pi over 4 rule is, is not well suited for non-spherical aberrations. This was well known in the adaptive optics community. What I'm going to show here is that it works well for electron microscopy. So here is, again, that probe size that decreases as a function of convergence angle, and the optimal Strel ratio lands at the minima of this convergence angle, uh, whereas the pi over 4 rules are suboptimal. And this is true over a range of convergence angles, so both from 10 milliradian for un uncorrected microscopes up to 30, 40 milliradians for next generation aberration corrected microscopes. We see the probe size error for the Strel ratio is much lower than that of the pi over 4 metrics. And, and that holds over thousands of simulated ronchograms, so we've tested this over a, a large set of data, and we see that the Strel ratio consistently picks the optimal aperture size, uh, whereas the pi over 4 rules uh, tend to be suboptimal. So the first takeaway is that the Strel ratio provides an optimal single, single value metric for assessing probe quality in STEM. So experimentally, how do we determine the, the uh, aberration function? In general, Ronchiogram evaluation techniques follow a similar flow. The Ronchiogram is segmented under an assumption that local behavior is essentially constant. An initial processing techniques applied to each segment of the Ronchiogram, and a fit is performed to find some parameterization, which can then be related back to the aberration function. For example, Sawada and colleagues demonstrated robust assessment using elliptical fits to autocorrelations done on ronchigrams across different defoci. Lupini and collaborators at NEON uh, use beam tilt and multiple ronchigrams to extract this information. And from the estimated aberration functions, you can then apply one of the heuristics I just described earlier, for example, a pi over four phase rule or uh, what we're advocating for is a Strel ratio. However, these procedures require multiple ronchiograms, and they have non-trivial systematic uh, errors that can result, and so it's an iterative process to converge on uh, an accurate assessment of the ronchiograms and alignment. What we're proposing here is that you instead use convolutional neural networks to directly determine the optimal convergence angle uh, of the microscope. So we use a single image trained on a single value that is the optimal convergence angle determined using the Strel ratio. So for this neural network to perform well, it's critical that you have a large set of data. In this case, we produce around 100,000 ronchigrams generated with an even distribution across uh, optimal aperture convergence angles. So if you randomly generate ronchigrams, you'll run into the problem that you'll oversample. Most ronchigrams with random aberrations are very poor, right? So you'll oversample the low convergence angles. So what you want to do is engineer a data set that has a nice uniform distribution across optimal convergence angles, in this case going from 0 to 100 milliradians. And we do this using, again, this 0 0.8 Strel ratio metric, which can reliably predict the best convergence angle. We then train our data so that uh, it can identify the optimal convergence angle for any ronchigram. Here we use basically a, a, um, an out-of-the-box AlexNet like a neural net. And we train, it's a convolutional neural network that we train against a single value, which is uh, the convergence angle. To test the performance of the neural network, we really want to compare it against human performance. So, sorry, my videos. Need a second. So, we want to also evaluate how well humans perform. So, what we did is we made a game where 
uh, trained electron microscopists can choose the apertures for randomly generated bronchiograms. So here I'm showing how that game is played. You effectively draw the aperture you want where you think it belongs. Um, and you can get statistics. You can also get feedback from this game. So if you want to get better at evaluating ronchigrams, um, you can, after you make your best guess, you can show what the neural net thought. You can also show what these pi over four uh, heuristics or, or Stroh ratio heuristics predict. And so you can shift your bias. If there's a systematic bias that you have in selecting ronchigrams, you can, you can um, train yourself to be more optimal. Nonetheless, if you do this for thousands of times, what we still find, even with training, that the humans can't outperform the neural nets. The human, if you, if you do this enough, you can get down to around three to four seconds to, per ronchigram evaluation, whereas the network is 0 .007 seconds, and the network has very little probe size error. That is, the actual probe size, as we show here on the right, of the neural net lands in the minimum probe size of the microscope uh, for a given ronchigram. So the ronchigram shown in the center shows the microscopist selection, in this case an overestimate of the aperture size compared to that of the network, and so the human choice would have given poorer resolution with more probe tails when compared to the neural net and would have been much slower. So uh, we at least demonstrated preliminarily that it works on experimental data as well. So we can artificially introduce aberrations or defocus and see that the neural net's prediction follows the expected trend. That is, as we bring the ronchigram closer into focus, the convergence angle increases. And as we go out of focus, it decreases in a way that you expect. So here we're showing the neural net working on data off the microscope, selecting an 18 milliradian aperture for an in-focus image, which is about what we expect for the, the microscope um, under, under the alignment conditions we had. And uh, as we go out of focus, we add two-fold stigmatism. We see that we're going down to 11 milliradian aperture. So the two conclusions are that, one, the Strel ratio is a better metric for assessing convergence angle, and it's the heuristic that we need to train neural nets on ronchigrams. And then we then use the conver convolutional neural nets to accurately and quickly assess these ronchigrams, uh, both on simulated data, which we, we know we have a ground truth and we can compare to, and, it, it, and it's very accurate, and it seems to also work on experimental data. The quality of the training is, of, of course, always related to the quality of the data sets. So with more ground truths, better s simulations that account for things such as um, um, uh, multiple scattering uh, or, or chromatic aberrations can improve the accuracy uh, on experimental data. But the implications, I would just note, are more than just real-time assessment of the alignment of your microscope. You can also use that real-time uh, uh, assessment as a feedback mechanism for aligning the microscope. So this is a preliminary example of showing how that might look, where you can go to an unoptimized beam on the left, a 9 milliradian convergence angle, and using these fast feedback loops provided by the neural net, you can tune, just basically randomly guess through a simulated annealing approach to converge onto an aligned microscope after even just 100 iterations. So this would be 100 ronchigram measurements to get to an optimized electron beam, just using a very uh, dumb simulated annealing approach. So with that, I will conclude, again, acknowledging the two students who did uh, substantial work on this, Noah Schnitzer and Sukyun Sung. Sukyun's here to, uh, as a co-presenter to answer questions.